السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي ونسلم على رسوله الكريم أما بعد and welcome back to the Islamic Knowledge YouTube channel and today we're having a look at another book that's related to the history of Islamic uh, law or what you might call fiqh it's titled The Canonization of Islamic Law A Social and Intellectual History written by Ahmad al-Shamsi printed by Cambridge now this book essentially follows the life of what you may who you may refer to as one of the most important, if not the most important person when it comes to the history of fiqh. And that is Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah and the theory of Imam al-Shafi'i which was embraced by the muhaddithun of the time. Um, the book uh, is not a massive book. It's about, page, it's about 225 pages, 226 approximately. Printed originally in 2013 and most scholars will have already had access to it or have read it already. But I want to speak from a student's perspective here. So if you're in perhaps your fourth or fifth year of Islamic studies or you know, anywhere similar to that, I would say that this book will be a good read for you. Now, the only issue is certain places the reading is a bit challenging in the sense that the words used may challenge you a little bit and you may have to pick up a dictionary, but don't feel shy to do that. And inshallah, you will learn some new interesting facts in this book. Now, interestingly, this book essentially is following the life of Imam Shafi. Now, we know that Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah was born in Gaza, moved to Mecca, then studied under Imam Malik in Medina. It, this was at a time after which uh, he then later went to Yemen. But before this time, before he studied under Imam Malik, Imam Muhammad, uh, the student of Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, had already studied under Malik many, many years ago. So now back to Imam Shafi'i, when he now goes to Yemen, he goes from Imam Malik, rahimahullah, back to Makkah, to Yemen, and there's a bit of back and forth in the middle but then at one point in approximately 183 Hijri he travels to Baghdad and he's actually taken uh, and accused of a rebellion and he for the first time meets Imam Muhammad ibn al-Hassan right now remember Imam Muhammad's already studied under Imam Malik so when Imam al-Shafi comes to Imam Muhammad he's coming as essentially a Maliki he's behaving and talking uh, and breathing like a Maliki so Imam Muhammad kind of knows how to debate with him so the author on page 10 kind of speaks when he discusses his book a little bit he speaks about how Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah through the debates that he had with Imam Muhammad kind of opened his mind a little bit and it kind of made him understand that there are certain things maybe of Imam Malik's approach that he's already embraced that he needs to maybe look at again so he says here, these Iraqi debates had a formative impact on a Shafi thought. So, so that doesn't mean he started agreeing with Imam Muhammad. He just started to realize perhaps both are wrong. Perhaps the Iraqi approach is wrong and perhaps Imam Malik's approach was wrong. And therefore he came up with his own theory. And we're going to come across that theory and how important that was. So in particular, they shaped the development of his ideas about the respective roles of hadith and, the commun and communal consensus. Uh, in jurisprudence and contributed to his gradual estrangement from his erstwhile teacher Malik. So... Essentially, he plays the most important role, Imam Shafi'i, in kind of coming up with a theory that makes the Sahih Hadith the central focus of Islamic law. Now, before him, they would consider other traditions to be also, you know, normative or things that may be considered as part of uh, Islamic law. Uh, and other methodologies were accepted until a shafii came and changed everything when we say changed everything he created a you could say a very systematic methodology that was adopted by the later scholars so um <clears throat> A really, really beneficial part, by the way, is on page 168 to 169, when he speaks about the different theories on Islamic law. Uh, the first one by Joseph Schacht, uh, which is that there were two ancient schools. Firstly, you had the school of Kufa or the school of Iraq, and then you had the school of Hijaz or the school of Medina. Um, which then later became personal schools. Then he puts, speaks about the second theory, which is George Makdisi and his student, Christopher Melchett, uh, who speak about the uh, ancient schools, then the personal schools, and then they add one more, which is the classical or guild school. Then he speaks about Wa'il Hallaq and his theory, 
so he discusses all of that and remember the book is essentially following the life of Imam Shafi'i to a large degree and the best part and one of the most you know profound parts of the book is where he speaks about you know how the Ahlul Hadith and the Ahlul Ra'i had a slight ikhtilaf on you know you could say slight but it was pretty major on certain issues where the Ahlul Ra'i were really really good at fiqh and you know kind of problem solving and the Ahlul Hadith had an issue with that because there was an element of fallibility uh, you you were coming up with your own opinions they didn't they didn't really like the idea of you engaging so much and coming up with new masail and new rulings so essentially the Ahlul Hadith had a choice when a Shafi'i came he gave them an option you could say that you can still let Hadith become the focus of your methodology but you need to engage in fiqh now so he says the primary reason for the appeal of a Shafi'i's theory among the Ahlul Hadith was most probably its potential for resolving an acute dilemma that confronted traditionally scholars at this time. This was the seemingly unavoidable choice between, on the one hand, being hopelessly outgunned in debates with the Ahlul Ra'i, who, as seen in chapter 1, could draw on a sophisticated arsenal of argumentative strategies or on the other hand adopting the latter's legal reasoning but thereby transgressing against their own principles by as they traditionally saw it ascribing fallible human opinions to God and his prophet and essentially the Ahlul Hadith kind of adopted a Shafi'i's approach uh, and then which he had kind of codified in his book Ar-Risala and this became you could say uh, doctrine to, for a lot of them and this became the main kind of dogma for most Muslims the Ummah kind of accepted Imam Shafi's approach and therefore Ulum al-Hadith is forever indebted to a Shafi'i as he kind of connected the fields of Hadith and Fiqh together um, right uh, to some degree and you know you, you're free to disagree with that 100% and you're, you, you're also free to disagree with the contents of this book it doesn't mean 100% everything he's saying is right but he's putting together a good story of how we think the law developed and how the history and the story behind Islamic law and how did we get to where we are Again, a bit of a challenging read in certain places. I will, inshallah, share these notes uh, on the Islamic Knowledge uh, Telegram channel. However, it's really, really important to focus on Imam Shafi'i when it comes to the history of fiqh. And really, many, many uh, benefits can come out of reading his life and the manaqib of Imam Shafi'i. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. So if you can, this book is available on Amazon. I will put the link in the description below. If you want to have a look at it, it discusses the difference of opinion between the Ahlul Ra'i and Ahlul Hadith really well. It speaks about Imam Malik's Muwatta and what he was trying to do and essentially how Imam Shafi'i had adopted or he was in line with the approach of Imam, Imam Malik uh, before he came to Baghdad. And it's only after he came to Baghdad and had the debates with Imam Muhammad, the Iraqi debates, as the author calls it, that you could see Say he developed a different theory altogether and that's why this book is really you know a fantastic read um, you will enjoy it inshallah ta'ala and I hope that if you do enjoy this video you also like it share it and subscribe to our uh, Islamic knowledge YouTube channel Jazakumullah khaira wa al jaza and until the next video Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh